Welcome viewers, our guest today is Mr. Ted Sloan, an artist and a popular personality of the Peace region. It's great to have you here, Ted. It's a lot of fun to be here. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, please tell us about yourself in your own words. Oh, this is a good question. Um, I am, so I'm, I'm a local here, and a lot of people call me an actor and a personality and things, but I would say uh, my favorite description of myself, and someone told me this once, is uh, Ted Sloan is a box. So you, you ask Ted to do something, he disappears for a while, and then he'll do whatever you need him to do. So that's kind of how I would describe myself, is I, I really like adventures, and I like uh, public relations and things. So if there are things that need to be done, I'm the kind of person who likes to do it. So I go in, I've been on radio, I've been in theater, I've been in some other medias, but I, I'm a, a local adventurer and doer. Great, thank you. And when did you discover your passion for arts? You know, I never wanted to be an artist. I thought it was kind of strange. Um, when I was younger, in grade eight, my dad's a teacher, he was a teacher, and I thought I would be a great teacher. And so I kind of took some theater on the side, but I was, I was a nerd, so I took all the math and the sciences and all the gyms, and I was a weird Jimmy slash academic nerd. But then I did a play in grade eight, lost my voice entirely, um, destroyed the show, but it went well. <laughs> and then I kind of forgot about acting. I, I did it off and on. But then in my, I graduated from grade 12. And uh, I went to, to follow a girl to university. It didn't work, had my heart broken. Stayed here in Fort St. John and ran into a professional actress who lives in this community. And she said, can you help me with my play? And it was there that I really started to go, oh, I could, I could, I could do this. So what's the main lesson you learned as a student besides the romance? <laughs> I learned that romance doesn't work. No, okay. uh, Everyone has a broken heart. It, they do. And it's... Uh, <laughs> Not necessarily, but possibly. Well, and it's actually that was... It's one of the lessons I learned is that everything happens for a reason. Because if I hadn't had my heart broken in grade 12 by this lovely girl who we're, we're friends with now, but I never would have got to acting. Um, and that taught me a really cool lesson. It's called... It's actually a neat... Um, method of acting. It's called the Stanislavski method. And here's your, your very boring acting method. But acting taught me that there are four main questions you need to ask. Um, the first question you need to ask yourself in life is, what do I want? Because when you break down a script and you're an actor, you go, okay, I'm a character. What do I want out of life? What do I want out of this script? And so you identify that. Then the second question you ask is, okay, I know what I want, so how do I get it? Then once you figure out how you're going to get it, you ask yourself the third question and say, okay, what is in my way of getting this thing? You identify the problem. And the fourth question you ask is, how do I get around that problem? And that's the biggest lesson I learned in school because that's how you approach a script. I mean, say you're playing Romeo in Romeo and Juliet. Well, you look at the script and you say, okay, Romeo really wants to live a happy life with Juliet. He wants to live out his days as a married man. That's what he wants. How does he get it? Well, he mar he's got to marry Juliet, he's got to escape, and he's got to find somewhere to live. What's in his way? Nobody wants him to marry. And, and the houses are, are fighting, the, the two families. So how does he get around it? And that's where the fun part is. So he marries her in secret. He runs away. He do does these things. So that, that's the big lesson that I learned because you can take those four questions and apply them to a script. But you can also apply them to life. You can say, you know, what do I want in life? How am I going to get that? What is really standing in my way from getting what I want? And how do I get around that problem? And so those are the, the, big, the big lessons that I learned. I went to school for four years to learn those four questions. Thank you. And what's the scope of arts and entertainment in our region? That's a really interesting question. I'm glad that you asked because Stage North is, is I mean, the, the, the arts in Fort St. John are incredible. We have a great music scene. I don't know anything about it, but I know it's great. Um, we've got a really neat fine art scene where we've got a lot of really talented fine artists who are painting and, and doing things like that. And in acting, we have a weird scene because we've got a couple of really talented people and a couple of people who are really talented but won't say it. So Stage North, the local acting company, which is the oldest company north of Prince George and the biggest company in northern BC, and, and actually it's the biggest company in northern BC and most of northern Alberta, um, they're really attacking the scene and trying to make it bigger and better. So for instance, they're doing eight plays next year. 
and most professional companies do six. So they're really trying to bolster audiences and they're also doing, what they really want is they want to bring in a lot new, uh, a lot more new actors. Because Stage North, I don't, like a lot of sometimes here in Fort St. John, um, we're, we got really good volunteers, but sometimes we call upon the same volunteers again and again and again, and those people get worn out. And Stage North is at a point right now where we've worn out a lot of our old volunteers, so we're getting new people to come in. And it's, a, it's fun because you've got people who are, who are brand new to the acting scene. And it's, it's a bit hard as well. Some people ask, well, how can I get into Stage North and things? So what they're really trying to do is they are trying to open their social media. They're trying to go to the cultural center and say, if you have questions about the acting scene, come to the uh, cultural center. And they're trying to be more open because the, the scope was this big. And now they're trying to make it this big. So the scope is, is getting bigger. Thank you. And who are your favorite classic drama writers? This is a hard question. Um, He's not 100% classic, but his name is Eugene O'Neill, and he's a classic American writer. And he wrote a play called Long Day's Journey Into Night, and he also wrote a play called The Gorilla. And um, these were realistic plays, which um, we call them uh, kitchen sink dramas, where they take place in one room, and it's just life, very, very messy, splayed out. So Long Day's Journey Into Night is about a family falling apart. And the gorilla is about a man who doesn't know where he's going to go, and he's a big, he, he's a man out of time. And so Eugene O'Neill just writes these really, um, really detailed, really realistic plays, but like f a long time ago. So he was ahead of his time, and they're just harsh and fun, but they're redeeming at the end. Sometimes people think that actors go, oh, I just want to feel and I want to be gross and I want to make you have a shower afterwards because I'm all messy. And... But Eugene O'Neill writes plays that have hope. And I'm a really big fan of hope in plays. And, and so I don't have a, a favorite classic writer, but I have favorite classic plays that have hope in them. So I hope that answers the question. Absolutely. Okay. And do you have some favorite drama characters? Um... I, I do, but my favorite characters lately have been, lately I've turned from acting to directing, just because I like to teach people here. And so my favorite characters are the ones that are being brought to me. And that sounds very pompous, but I've got to work with a lot of local actors. And I teach them some methods and they, they come back the next day and they go, I read this about my character and I think these 16 things about them. And to me, that's really, really interesting. So I'm not as big a fan of, of characters in literature. I mean, there's some that I'd love to do and be, but I'm more and more finding that I'm loving watching people, how people interpret those characters. Because I have my interpretations. I think Romeo is kind of a, you know, he's a lovesick romance puppy. But then I, my, my good friend will say, I think Romeo is a hero. And then my other friend will say, I think Romeo is an idiot. So I more enjoy how people interpret those characters and how different it is from me. So I, I don't have a favorite one, but I have such fun watching people tell me theirs. Thank you. And please quote your favorite dialogue. Okay. I couldn't do this, but what I wanted to do is quote my favorite play. So there is a play called Next to Normal, and this is a musical, and it's, it just hit the scene about 15 years ago. And I'm a very big believer in, in, in mental health. Um, my family has had long history with it, and it's, it's something I'm very passionate about, speaking about. And so this play is incredible because it's about a mom and a dad, and a daughter and a son, and life is normal. And the play starts, and the mom starts getting sick. And she's suffering from, from schizophrenia. And it shows how hard it is to, to live with someone. And the, how the mom is struggling, and the dad is struggling, and the daughter is struggling, and the son is struggling. And then halfway through the play, you realize that the son isn't real. He died at birth, and he's just a hallucination of the mom. And no one else can see the son but the mom. And it's traumatic because the second act, the mom is going through all of these therapies and you can see how she doesn't know who she is and the daughter doesn't know who she is and you can see the dad just loves the mother through this play and says, I don't know what you're going through. I know you're hurt. I'm hurting too, but I'm here for you. 
And meanwhile, the son is there, and no one can see that. And the mom keeps talking to the son, and everyone goes, you're, you're, he's not there, you're, you're crazy. And she goes, I'm not, he is here. And in the very end of the play, there's this beautiful, beautiful scene where the mom comes to the door and says, I think I'm healed. And the dad goes, oh, this is, I've been waiting for this day. We can be a family again. She goes, I was him healed, but I don't love you anymore because how I was healed changed me. And the dad goes, but I, 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 you put me through this hell and I've stayed with you the entire time. You're going to leave. And she goes, I have to. And she leaves and the door closes and the son is there. And the son says, Dad. And the dad goes, no, I know you're not real. You're supposed to leave with the mom. And the son says, Dad, all I really want to know is, what is my name? Because no one has said his name throughout the entire play. And so the last scene of the play is the dad just collapsing in his son's arms and saying, your name is Gabriel. And it's just so beautiful. And, and I'm sorry that I'm tearing up, but it's just because it shows how hard mental health is and how there, there's no winners, but there can be a lot of losers. And it just kind of breaks every emotion in you, um, but shows how powerful love is as well at the same time. So that's kind of my favorite dialogue without being my favorite dialogue. Oh, thank you. It's all you know, important for all of us to feel the sensitivity. Human beings, they feel deeply for each other. and. Uh, I have no words here except for, you know, feeling what you are saying. Uh, coming to some other questions, yeah. uh, to cheer you up a little, <laughs> please comment on the famous quote of Del Close, the only rule is that there are no rules. I also learned in school that, that you have to know the rules of acting to break them, and I love that because as I'm getting older and I hang out with a lot of people who are younger than me, um, and they're all like, oh, there's no rules, ah, da, da. But I find it's way more fun to know all of the rules and then break them. Because it, that just means, A, you get an adrenaline rush from breaking the rules. And I'm saying, don't break the rules. But if you have to, it's so much better to know them. Because then you know how to manipulate them. And that sounds awful. Manipulation has a really bad connotation. Because people think, oh, manipulating is bad. But when you're working together with a group especially, if you can say, okay, the rule is this. For instance, the library, I work at the library right now, and we're not allowed to throw dodgeballs in the library because you know, things will get broken. But if we go, well, we're not throwing dodgeballs, but we're throwing literacy balls, then I can let my kids run around the library throwing dodgeballs at each other, and they're having a blast, and they're breaking the rules, but we had to know that the rule was in there so that we can tell a secret and avoid them. So my commentary on the, the only rules there is no rules, I don't think that's true. I think there are always rules, but there's always ways to break the rules. And that, to me, makes life more interesting. And as you're saying, probably, you know, uh, the interpretation seems to be breaking rules within the rules. Yeah. And now please comment on the famous quote of Oscar Wilde, every saint has a past, every sinner has a future. Um, okay, so this, this one may seem odd, and I'm going to go, in my life I've had a lot of adventures, and one of them was Bible school. And I went to, I've always wanted to, to be a, a pastor. But in my professional acting career, I got to do this certain play, and it was called um, Love and Human Remains. And it's a disgusting play if you look at it. In it, there's lots of murder, there's lots of, of love that's not legal, and it, it's quite a terrible play. But we all sat down, and our director said, this is a terrible play, but you all have to know the reason why we're doing this play is because in the end, it shows that love wins, and love always has to win. And we had read it and went, love doesn't win in this play. And he said, no, this is how it wins here. And he pointed out to us uh, how, even though lots of bad things were happening, in the end, love has won. And that, to me, struck a chord. So in this play, for instance, speaking of rules, I had to break a lot of rules and I actually called my mother and went, Mom, I'm doing this play. And my mom said, I'm not coming to see it because it was just full of, of not good things. And she eventually saw it in, in secret and she loved it. But, um, and I had to do this 
kind of really nasty, not family friendly act to, to a woman of all things. And, uh, but in the end, my character gets its due. And in the end, that character and shows the trials and tribulations of, of that woman that, that I am part of and how love overcomes this. Uh, and I went to Bible school because of that, because I sat down basically in my Bible school and said, I did this to a woman on stage. That's why I'm a pastor. And everyone stopped. And we all prayed that day. But that, what's that, basically, long story short, is every, every saint has a past and every sinner has a future, is I think that saint and sinner are, I can't call anyone either of that, because what I thought was a sinner in my play was a saint just because he had a whole different level of moral standards. And what I sometimes called a saint was really a sinner because the moral standards of their life had said how they had fallen. So in a roundabout way, I guess so what I'm saying is that every saint has a past, every sinner has a future. You, you kind of can't, can't label people those two things because you don't, A, you're not them, B, you don't know their story, and C, they have a whole different set of codes. So no one is good and bad to another's eyes, I guess. This is getting deep. Um, but you really have to go to your own moral code and how you how that, because yeah, you could do an awful thing, but it's actually a really good thing. Only you know that and someone else doesn't, though. So in a very roundabout way, I guess it's... Um, is you, you don't know anyone else's story, so you can't you can't call them those things. Good point. And who is the best actor in the world, in your opinion? Um, the best actor in the world, in my opinion, is one whose name you'll never know. And not because you don't know actors, or I don't know actors, but I've been very blessed to work with some very good, talented actors, um, some actors who have gone on and done amazing things. But the best actors in the world, I find, are the ones that walk on to set. Like I was a junior actor, and never once did they say, look at me, I'm a good actor. They were only interested in building me as an actor. And I never realized the amazingness of this until I watched them work and how amazing they are. But they never, ever claimed how good they were. So I think the best actor in the world is that actor who you encounter who will never put himself first, but looks to make the whole cast, the whole ensemble better. So there are some fantastic actors out there. I look up to Sir Ian McKellen and, and Patrick Stewart, and uh, there's a couple of Canadian actors, a local named John Kirkpatrick, and another one named Josie Labacane, who are born here and have gone to amazing things. But the best actors are the ones on set who make you feel like a better actor than them. Excellent point. So not only the actors we see, but the ones who play the support roles, sometimes behind the scene, because not only, as you have said, they're not only actors, they're supporters, they're practitioners, they make others successful. Mm -hmm. Excellent point. And finally, Ted, what's your message for the artists and actors of our community? I would say if you're an actor from this community, um, don't stop. I would say that you have more opportunity than anyone ever, and that find the people around the community who you look up to, ask for their help, and fail. There's an amazing quote um, by an English playwright. It says, fail, fail better. And to me, that means a lot because as an actor, we also say, we're building sandcastles, we're tearing them down. If you go out to try and be a perfectionist and try and get that job right off the top, you're going to fail. But that's not a bad thing. It just means that you're going to meet a whole bunch of people. And then you're going to try something else, and you're going to fail again, and you're going to meet a whole bunch of people. And by the time you have a 40-year career, you'll notice it's all full of failures, but your failures got your success. Excellent. Yes. And the other thing is, is if you're going to be an actor, you're probably going to starve for at least 15 years, but it's a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for coming to our program, and we wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you very much.